Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And I'm going to try something new just in, in respect for my guest here. Uh, uh, hold on. Ohio, konnichiwa, or konbanwa. Uh, depending upon <laughs> what time of day you are tuning in, welcome to Run It Back, episode number 94. I am your host, Menelik Fernandez. Uh, the premise of the show, of course, remains the same, where we take teams that have played previously and we run it back, so to speak, where we talk about game preparation we talk about you know what goes into your scout what you think is important to teach your guys as you're leading up to the game we talk about time management game management game planning we talk about in-game adjustments all these things that are really proprietary to coaches i guess you could say uh but i love it i think it's informative and it's been an incredible ride i'm happy to say to, to that today is the 21st country that uh, Run It Back has covered from around the world. So that's pretty cool. Uh, today's game, we are looking at a Tokyo Samurai U18 game versus Ohori High School. Uh, the YouTube upload date was April 4th of this year. I don't know if that's the correct date of the game. Uh, and then I'm joined by uh, you know, the leader of the Tokyo Samurai Club, uh, Chris Deason, who I met originally through uh, Run It Back. Chris, give me a second. Uh, I'm going to share what I found to try and give you a warm welcome to the show. Uh, uh, okay. Please correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I, I found online you're the director of the Tokyo Samurai. That has been for eight years now. Uh, you did some stuff with uh, Japan basketball. Uh, you were there as an assistant coach. Uh, you've also been at St. Mary's International School for the better part of a decade, basically. Three years as a head coach, seven years with the JV team. Uh, Chris, you know, big, uh, a big formal welcome. Thank you so much for joining. It's it's really a pleasure to have you here on Run It Back. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm 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 humbled to be on. You know, um, it's just I'm happy to talk basketball, and you know, I, I'm excited to actually talk about you know Japan basketball uh, and how things kind of go here. Your Japanese was spot on. Thank you very uh -huh. much. I I tried. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have been there actually, so I, I managed to uh, to fumble through a little bit. And I always say this uh, whenever an anybody asks me about Japan. Japan is the country in the world where I have found people that are local are most willing to help, and they're really, I mean, respectful is obviously a term that is thrown around a lot, but they're really. Uh, elated that you try to immerse yourself in their culture and try to learn and all that. So if you make mistakes, they don't make you feel like a, a foreigner or a bum or somebody who's outside. They, they correct you and they do it with respect and try and keep you going in the learning path, which I love. Yeah. So I was only supposed to be here for one year and it's turned into 17. So, Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was actually born here. So my mother's Japanese. My father was American, you know, and he's, he was military and, uh, he was out by, by the time I was born, but I was born here and left when I was two, came back a couple times and then just decided, hey, you know what, I'm going to come back, teach English for a year and then go back to the States to be done. One year turned into yeah. <laughs> 17. A decades later, <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. So let, let's start here. Give me some background sure. on your league, your organization, this age group, the level of competitiveness, fill us in, color color in the edges, so to speak, of what's going on in Japanese basketball and, and specifically with the Tokyo Samurai. Yeah, so Japanese basketball, like for ourselves as Tokyo Samurai, we're kind of like an AU club, which is an anomaly in Japan. Um, where, where I'm at, St. Mary's, so I've been coaching there for 10 years, um, we have a league of international schools and military based schools. And so it's, it's run like an American kind of system. So right. November through February is our season and, you know, end of season tournaments, all these other things. And, and we'll actually kind of, we play around Asia a little bit. So within our league, we play within Tokyo, but we'll play tournaments in Korea. We'll play tournaments, uh, in Hong Kong, we'll see teams from Taiwan and Singapore and, um, Thailand. Um, so that's within our school system um, with the other military base, things like that, you know, but with Japan basketball uh, at the high school age, high school basketball runs Japanese basketball. So Japan basketball, the JBA uh, kind of oversees high school basketball uh, and high school basketball in Japan is year round. 
there's no club teams or there are club teams, but there's, there are very few um, club teams for high school age. Um, you know, the, the kind of running joke for high school basketball for these high level teams is they practice 370 days out of the year. They just, wow. they, yeah, they practice all the time. They play all the time. Uh, the, the high level clubs or high level high schools. Um, but they're, it's, it's kind of like you're, you're full on dedicated, you know, and depending on the school that you're at, one of the schools on a trip has over hundred kids on the team. Um, you know, that's just, so they got like whatever JV F or something. I don't know how they actually right. run it. Um, but a lot of the teams will rock up with 40 players. Um, so, cause there's no JV, there's like kind of development teams. They don't call them JV, but they have like development teams. Um, and so if we host a game, like at St. Mary's, we'll host some, you know, Japanese teams, they'll bring in 40 kids. Cause that's just, they run these Japanese high schools, just run clubs and there's clubs for everything. And basketball is one of them, you know? And so if you're part of this club, then you're involved in it and they're super involved, right? You know, they're going six days a week. Even if you're right. not a very good team, you're going six days a week. Right. Um, and maybe you're playing on Sundays. So there's a lot of days. So we've, we've had a couple of kids that played on these high level teams and, you know, trying to get them to come practice with us is just, it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, so what's recently happened within the last, I want to say three or four years is the professional league here. Uh, maybe, maybe it was like eight years ago, they mandated, they, well, sorry, they came back and they made a new league because there used to be two leagues in Japan. And so they made a new league. And in that league, they told the teams, you have to have an under 15 club team as kind okay. of a development. So they're trying to take more like this European approach of you play with your professional club team and that's how you develop. And so a couple of years ago, they decided that they want to have everyone has an under 18 club team. Um, and so the professional teams do have under 18 clubs, um, you know, but they're still kind of developing and building. Um, and it really hasn't come to some of the higher level kids going to these clubs yet. Um, because the big draw in Japan is they have these two national tournaments. There's one in the summer um, and there's one in the winter. So the team that we played from the film actually won the championship in December. Oh, wow. Uh, so they're national champions. But the way that the school year goes, the school year starts in April. Once you finish in December, you're done as a, as a senior. You're, you're done playing and we kind of move on because we're, we're preparing for next April. Right. Um, so the team that we played was wasn't their championship team. I mean, they're defending champions, but it wasn't their team that won the whole tournament. Um, and the way that those tournaments are set up is every prefecture, I, to be honest, I don't remember how many prefectures. So prefectures are like states in Japan, right. like there's 60 something of them. They all qualify and there's a few extra bids. And so you have whatever 60 some, 70 some teams in this tournament, one and done, get to the championship, do it over a week, week and a half. Um, so clubs like ours and these other professional clubs don't have that opportunity to participate in that. So the B league itself, the professional league has their own kind of B league tournaments. Um, and so we were kind of on the outskirts now for us, originally we, we had no intention of really being part of Japanese basketball. When we, when I originally started it, um, a guy came out from, uh, from the States named uh, Dave Taylor, who runs the phenom camps out in San Diego, yep. which has a lot of these like high level kids that have gone through there. And he came out here to kind of run a clinic and we hit it off and like, you know, we've become good friends since then. And he, he used to run the double pump tournaments in LA. And he's like, Hey, why don't you bring a team out here? Uh, okay. We'll, we'll just see what it's like. We had a couple guys. I thought oh, they're pretty good, you know, and, and I hadn't been around, you know, AU basketball. I mean, in, in my generation, it was only the best players are playing those right. AU. Right. And the rest of us were just playing high school summer league or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, okay, this would be a good experience, you know? And um, so we decided to go out there uh 2014 and we brought 11 guys and we just got waxed like every game we're just getting smashed like in there <laughs> yeah right so because we, we were not prepared for it i was not prepared for it at the time right i was coaching still high school jv basketball uh and had been a head coach of a smaller school um and i'm like no nah, this isn't gonna happen like we cannot come back again because i was like this is fun the kids liked it uh and we ended up having a couple of kids that actually played college basketball on that team it's just like we just couldn't get it together right um and so then we started to kind of develop and you know 
practice a little more. And at the time then as well, we we're only practicing once a week uh, on a on a Saturday or Sunday. And here and there, we try to play some Japanese teams just to get us prepped. So we would only go basically end of the school season in February. So we go from March to July and be done. Like we come in July and then kind of be done. Uh, and then every once in a while, we'd get a few games here and there in the fall, just kind of get guys together. Uh, an interesting story from that is that um, back then there was a coach for the Nash, Japanese national team, the youth national team from Germany. He was heading up the youth programs and we got contacted and say, hey, you guys want to play the national team? They want to play Americans. It's like, oh, OK, yeah, for sure. So we went out there and played um, and all of our kids are about we played under 16 uh, and all of our kids were the same age, 16, 17, some were 15. Um, and we'd practice again at that point, like once or twice and played them. Uh, and at that time, I thought we were going to get just throttled, you know, because we just you know, had played in the States and it was two years after that. Uh, and we actually had a pretty good game with them. I remember we were down like seven with three minutes to go. I think they ended up beating us by 14. I was actually quite surprised at that point that, you know, Japanese basketball, where it was at as far as a youth, um, where it's at now, it's actually it's gone. It's grown quite a bit. Well, I mean, I've um, seen uh, you do an excellent job with your web page, and I've definitely seen you sort of push some of your kids like through the rising coaches site. So, I mean, there's and I've obviously watched this game. There's definitely talent there. Let me kind of bring you in a little bit to your yeah. team and, and leading up to this game. Uh, this team, how many games would they have played at this point in the season and what is sort of the structure of how this game gets organized like is it an actual league or are you still at this point just kind of getting games where you can because you're sort of on the outside of japan basketball if i'm understanding correctly right so this was an exhibition game um so i don't know actually how many games they'd played up to that point again japanese teams some play quite a bit it's not publicized a lot as far as any media or things like that. The only reason I'd known they played two games is they were actually on, they'd played before two pro games. And so those are televised. If you play oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, you know, they'll uh, bring in some bigger schools to kind of play each other as an exhibition kind of preparation, you know, cause all these teams are still trying to figure out their own teams, you know, cause they're, they're these freshmen haven't started school yet, but some right. of them are already there. Right. Um, and so this type of game, like what what's actually supposed to be happening in in Tokyo now is they're having a Tokyo league where we're in a league with these other high schools. Okay. Um, Cause there is no league in Japan. There are no leagues. They're just, you play these one offs, one offs, one offs, play a tournament and then one offs, one offs, play a tournament, you know? And so Japan basketball thought there, there needs to be more meaningful games for kids to play. So they have like kind of tiers, you know, of the, 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 the level of schools and they play each other, but club teams can be involved. So now we've, but that hasn't it not it didn't get started last year because of COVID. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Would the goal of an athlete that plays for you be to get a scholarship to the U.S. or would it be to play pro for the parent clubs a lot? Like, how does that work really with motivation? Yeah, so it's a combination. Um, I mean, over the years, one we have developed a good relationship with Japan basketball as far as like try to push national team players. Right. Um, one of our players was in the Olympics, you know, last year. And that's kind of where it all started was that first game we played. They saw him and he was six, nine, and he'd only been playing basketball for a year and a half. Um, so I think a lot of the motivation for like we get a lot of, again, international players. Kids are at base schools. Kids are at international schools. But we're starting okay. to see more Japanese kids wanting to be involved because it's becoming more uh, of a thing for them to start thinking about going to the States. They want to go play in the States, right? They want to play at the highest level. Well, right. how do you do that? Um, well, go play for Tokyo Samurai because they go to the States, you get seen, you know, and, you know, we try to make a lot of connections with the coaches to kind of, you know, push these kids to get coaches to understand, like, there is uh, a good level of basketball out here. Just no one knows about it. Right. You know, they might be a little bit undersized depending on what you're looking for. Um, but some of the things that, well, you know, hey. like, <laughs> Yeah, what I, I what I yeah, they can play. When I've said to coaches, you know, honestly, like recently, it's like, you know, with with the transfer portal going on, I think like, if you get a Japanese player, like they're they're dedicated to what you're, you know, 
to to you. You know, you're gonna have a kid that's gonna stick it out because some of the coaching here is pretty brutal. But those kids just stick it out. You know, again, 370 days out of the year kind of stuff. They're like, oh, whatever. You know, you have practice for whatever 20 hours, whatever it is. You know, I can handle that. You know, that's no problem. Yeah, yeah, it's no problem for them. But it's just the dedication they have and the loyalty they have for their schools and their programs. It's like if you get a kid like that comes in, there's a good chance he doesn't transfer. You know, unless right. it's you know kind of an Americanized. And there's, you know, we see some of those where there's Americanized Japanese and it might be a little bit different, but um, so yeah, with our program, that's what most of the kids are trying to look for is they, you know, they want to play with us in the summer because we'll go to the States um, and, and right. try to play them from the coaches or we'll f- at least film it, you know, and then send it out to coaches. And there is some um, drive to as far as professionally, because we've had a few kids come through Um you know, because there hasn't yet been really a kid to go through a professional team's under 15 program, go all the way through, and now he's pro. Mm-hmm. There hasn't been a time either, but uh, I know of one. I know of one kid so far. It's not kids, a young man now, but um, that he went through um, a local team here, and now is on the, the the same team that he had played. But it's close to home, so I think that's a lot of was the motivation for him that uh, structure is actually still missing in Canada, right? Because we now have two pro leagues here. Uh, and then we obviously have clubs all like all the way down and we have AAU and travel teams. And, but there hasn't been anybody who has like the top down structure of they're at one and they're graduating players up that, that escalator, so to speak, to move into the pro at that level. We still are losing a large percentage of our kids to the States because that's course. the draw division one basketball, right? So let me move into the game a little bit. Let's uh, let's get outside of the framework and move into here. You mentioned that this is an exhibition type game. How soon before will you know that you're going to play this game? Um, you mentioned that there are the previous, you know, national champs. What kind of importance do your players put on it? And let's start getting into a scout. If anything, what do you, what are you guys putting into that for them? Sure. So we had been trying to schedule this for a year. Um, wow. Yeah, but because of we had to fly down there um, and because of COVID, like there were kind of these ups and downs and spikes, you know, like I said, basketball hadn't really, really stopped in Japan. There were some pauses here and there, but teams were still playing. But of course, we were all kind of being cautious about, you know, we don't want to bring it to some team. Some team doesn't, you know, and if this is an exhibition game, um, there doesn't hold a lot of value, you know. It, it it does like our kids were super excited about it because they knew like these guys just won and we knew they're really good. They're, you know, one of the top teams, but the, there was actually two teams about, I don't know, 20 minutes from each other in the same city that are like top three teams. So they're like, they're like one in three or one in four every year. Okay. So we came down to go play both those teams. Um, so that's where we kind of, you know, uh, we, that's how we were trying to set up our trip is to go down and we were able to get a couple other teams because some other schools were coming in from a little bit closer to come play. So we actually got to play them as well. Um, so we ended up with like four and a half games or something that we played. Um, we co- played a couple half games. Um, and so that's where we, when we set it up and I, like I mentioned, we had, there, there were two games that were actually televised or online that I was able to watch. So that's where kind of the, where the, where the scouting came in is, is knowing. And I knew that they have like three national team players on their team. Um, one was hurt in the two games that we were playing, but the two were playing um, in our team. We also have, we have two on our team, you know, so they all, they know each other. Okay. Um, and so I wasn't sure if the other kid who I thought might've been the better of the three was going to play in our game. Um, and so it's a little bit kind of tricky to kind of let the kids know, like, here's the team we're playing. Um, this guy's, these two guys are playing, but this guy might be, we don't know, you know, and trying to figure that out, you know, but when we get there, the two guys that were playing were out <laughs> and the other guy that wasn't playing was in okay, you know, because of injuries <laughs> and things like that, you know, and so we're adjusting. And then our, one of our players was our starter got injured the day before. So he wasn't playing. So it's a little bit of a scramble to kind of figure out how are we going to match up? You know, some of these other guys, you know, we weren't too sure of their other players. We weren't too sure of. So it was kind of a little bit, um, you know, 
playing a little bit blind, you know, as far as who we're playing against, the personnel we're playing against. So I, I love it from a perspective of a show. What what do you what do you do when you're flying blind? What are you giving your guys? Are you tailoring practice in a certain way? Is there a paper scout? Is there film that you're presenting to them? Or are you just taking in stuff and trying to get your guy like you know, guide me through your process. What do you do? Yeah. So the I mean, I'm I'm watching both of those games and I'm taking notes on specific players um specific sets that they're running you know is there something that they're going to run more often than others right you know and what is the you know where are they trying to get the ball to who are they trying to get the ball to and in, in those situations um and then one of the things like you know i i watched the national championship and i watched those guys play through except that, that tournament was in tokyo so i kind of was watching them anyway in december when they were playing uh and their press killed everyone they were just you know kind of really long and with this team they're they're a, a much bigger team they you know they recruit players private schools they recruit players they're a much longer team um than most of the japanese teams we played right. um you know and the interesting thing was is the day before we played that other team uh fukuoka daichi and they're smaller but really scrappy get into you and they just destroyed us because our guys just weren't ready for that kind of pressure right um but I knew like already didn't play the same style, but I was kind of like, we can't have another goose egg like that one. Like it was, it was pretty bad, you know, and it's kind of the, they, they play to the points. Like they just foul every play. Like it feels like, right. But it's like, if right. you play that hard, how many fouls is, are the refs going to call, you know? And so coming into the, the next day, you know, our kids were down because it's like, we just play this, you know, the number three team and just got destroyed. How are you go? You know, I don't know if the kids were down. I was down. I was like, how do we get these guys? turned around so that night man i don't know if i slept very well at all because i'm like how do we get this turned around because i thought we'd be way more competitive um all these questions yeah. are why many coaches drink you know <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um, yeah i was i was definitely drinking that night because i was like man <laughs> how do we fix this you know but i thought like just the way we matched up because they were not like this kind of really quick scrappy kind of team they're like long and lanky and um you know that's what we thought coming in um they're gonna be you know maybe not as aggressive i thought we matched up better with them anyway because we had a you know kind of a i mean for a japanese team we have a bigger team okay um and so so prior to that i was like i said i was, I was watching the film seeing what they're doing uh and i did a, a scout a breakdown for the kids so even for us like we don't we practice like twice a week so we still don't practice a lot um so a lot of stuff i'll do is on video and break down film or break down individual players um about kind of what we're looking for what they're trying to do what maybe we can do against that and you know just kind of draw it out for them on the screen what, what would that look like for you like would that be a couple minutes on plays and you'd put in like little title cards or uh a couple minutes on plays and a couple minutes on like how does that film look like and how do you deliver it to your guys so that specific one so depend like it depends you know it depends on how much film we have you know again how much time i have um because i'm you know we have a couple of the coaches but i i run the u18 so um you know most of that stuff's on me so for this specific one um there was no place cards. I've done it in the past where we're kind of say, okay, here's this set. We know the call already, right? Here's this set. This is what they're going to run. Here's what they're trying to do. Right. Um, for this one, I knew that there are certain, like they were doing some head taps and these kind of things that I knew what they were trying to get to. Um, so kind of preparing them for it, you know, and I said, they're going to have some wrinkles in it. So you can't just overplay it and just, you know, but you just need to be aware. Um, the, the, the other things I was really looking at was, again, the personnel, who, who's their guys? You guys need to be aware of who their guys are, what their tendencies are. And that's what I was trying to break down the film. And the other was their ball screen defense um, because we run a lot of ball screen stuff. And so I wanted them to be aware of how we can attack that. Um, and that's where we ended up. That's where we ended up attacking a lot of it um, because out here we play 24 shot clock. Right. Um, so We're within the international schools, <laughs> Yeah, with the international schools, there's either no shot clock or 35 second shot clock. But with Japanese, it's 24. And I love it. Like it's just, you know, it's it's up tempo, fast pace. And again, you're playing a team that presses, you know, you're down into 
17, 18 seconds in your shot clock or, you know, as soon as you get across the line kind of stuff. So you have to kind of, you got to move things quickly. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're looking at is what, what are they doing on ball screens and what can we do to kind of attack that? Cause we have, you know, a pretty dynamic point guard that can kind of get downhill. How do we get him kind of move into the basket, you know? And at the time we thought our other big was going to be playing, uh, who's also like a national team player. You know, we thought, and he didn't play, and that was an adjustment. I didn't know he was going to play until that morning. Uh, he had complained about the day before getting hurt, and then he wasn't playing, so we kind of had to adjust again. Um, but our kids were able to do it. They played a heck of a game. So leading up, like you mentioned, you're going to give them some video. Uh, you're going to focus on the things that you've mentioned. Uh, what would, like, shoot or practice that week look like comparative to other weeks? Would it be any different type deal? Would you be walking through their stuff? Or uh, would it be, like, we do what we do and we're going to do it well and, you know, kind of talk them through where it would apply? Yeah, so we didn't go through any of their stuff because the two games I saw, they ran a couple of the same things, but those a lot of just like motion kind of things. And so right. um, what we worked on was the, our ball screen offense and our ball screen defense. Cause we were going to go in and switch everything. And we came in um, and we had a, some smaller players. So we're working on trying to triple switch and things like that. Um, and then we were working on a, our press break. Um, because I knew that they had the, the ability to kind of turn it on if they wanted to go into press. And, and the good thing was the other team also pressed. It was kind of helping us in both ways. They press in a different way, so we kind of had to adjust. Uh, I mean, we did struggle. We, we had a couple bad turnovers against their pressure um, for easy baskets. And so at one point we had to call a timeout because it's like, okay, let's adjust. Let's, you know, get ourselves back together. Okay, we know we can – get through this press and they did and we went on a run after that but um those are the two main things that we were trying to really focus on uh leading up things that you do in game would you like if i often ask this question if there was a spectrum and at one end it's like we do what we do and we're going to stick to it and at the other end of the spectrum is like we're going to adjust for every opponent Things that you do, how where would they fall on this spectrum in terms of like attacking certain ball screen coverages, how many to the glass, pace of play that you want to play at, those kinds of things. How do they fall on that spectrum for you? Yeah, we mostly do what we do for the most part. We're going to do what we do. It depends. Like sometimes, you know, if it's a like a ball screen coverage that we're really struggling with, you know, where they're, they're really blitzing at us and we're having a hard time with it. Um, then we'd probably adjust, you know, or adjust to the player that we're actually using the ball screen with, right? Maybe okay. there's, there's an elite defender that's guarding a point guard. Okay. Let's, let's use our, our other guard. Cause we have, I mean, we're smaller, you know, in, in the sense that we have, we play with like three point guards basically that right. can run the point, you know, so we'll just, we'll maybe adjust to another player or, you know, some of our guys, you know, we're not quick enough just to say, Hey, slip that screen. Hey, ghost that screen, you know, where we have to come in a timeout and say, Hey, next time you go on a ball screen, slip that screen, give, give our guard a little bit more time to kind of read what's going on. Right. Um, but for the most part, we'll stick with kind of, you know, uh, when, when we think of up tempo and you think Japanese up tempo, it's very different. <laughs> Japanese play really fast. Okay. Um, Japanese teams play pretty fast. Um, this Ohi team a bit, but you can see like they 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 practice these long passes where guys will leak out, get a rebound, throw it up, you know. Um, and, I, and that's another thing that we're actually we, we focus on too was getting back on defense in transition, a transition defense because Japanese teams do turn the ball around really quick once they get it out. Um, there they there's oftentimes a guy leaking out and, and getting out in front. How do you uh, how do you focus on that? Is that just words to your guys? Like, hey, remember you got to go with, or do you do a lot of drills to kind of? Because like I find we'll as a coach, defensive transition is often one of my my weaker spots, and I think that so much of it is just motivation from wanting to defend. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do some disadvantage drills to kind of get them to sprint back. Uh, you know, we're always telling them sprint back to the paint. You know, because then you can you can kind of adjust from there. Um, and, but when they're playing that fast, we still have it where guys think, oh, that's my guy. I'm going to go with my guy. And there's a guy 
right. screaming behind them and, and trying to get them to, you know, to figure out and point out, like, I got this, my guy over here, or the guy that's running back is pointing out to his guy, you know, trying to communicate that. Um, and that also becomes, you know, sometimes a little bit uh, can be a little bit difficult is that not all of our guys speak English. Um, Interesting. Right. Some of them only speak Japanese. Um, a, a good majority of our players are bilingual because they're in the international kind of international school programs where they're growing up or they're well, actually a majority of our kids are half Japanese. You know, okay. I'll put it that way. So they're, they're, they're dual, dual language, um, dual citizens or dual passports. Um, so, but we do have, you know, Japanese players that only speak Japanese because they're from Japanese schools and they're trying to learn English. You know, so I'm also wondering how much do you actually understand of what I'm saying to you? So we, I have someone that's with me that's translating, you know, but, you know, if I'm yelling at the court, sometimes I'm just wondering how much do you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, is that one, they're, they're pretty smart basketball players, you know, and terminology is really similar. So they can kind of get the gist. And sometimes I'll find that the Japanese players, because they've been through so many reps, you know, they know what you're talking about you know, as opposed to some of our international players, you know, they're playing zone all year long for the school team. And we play man and, you know, and, and they'll have a harder time adjusting than our Japanese players, but it does, um, I don't know if it creates problems. It's just one more thing that we have to kind of think about as we kind one of more instruct. Thing to there, yeah. I was yeah. recently scouting in uh, the Taiwanese P league and it was, it was something that I noticed a lot too, right? Like I'd be like, uh, I'd be talking to my coach about certain things and I'm like, are you sure he understands you? Like, I know he's telling you he understands you, Yeah. but are you sure that he like is comprehension actually happening there? Or is he, you know, got a little bit too much pride to say, coach, I have no idea what you're saying right now. Right. Like just trying to grasp it on the fly. And like you, like you said, you know, they're good basketball players. They pick up things and figure out a lot of things, but there's intricacies in there sometimes that get overlooked yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, it's even like your English speaking kids. Do you got it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Stop it. Stop it right yeah. now. Yeah. Right. So uh, philosophies, like you mentioned you don't really change them. What are your philosophies on playing fast? Like, is there a target number of possessions you're going for? Uh, how are you looking at speeding them up? How many to the glass offensively for you? What are your philosophies on those kinds of things? So yeah, I'm not that intricate to know how many possessions we're getting in transition. <laughs> like we're, we, you know, we're trying to get it out as, as quickly as possible. Well, like I said, we're a little bit bigger, but we don't rebound as well because like the Japanese teams are really scrappy. They'll play with smaller guys. They'll, they'll push our guys and get rebounds. Like these higher level teams, like the lower level teams, our guys just kind of get every rebound because they're, they're right there, you know, but we've got kids six, seven, six, eight. Um, and you know, the other team we played before, yeah, they had a six ten guy, but the other, the other forward the power forward was like six, three, but he was out rebounding some of our guys, you know, of course I'm losing it. I'm like, how are you losing a rebound to this guy? Yeah. But um, he's physical and he's fighting. I bet. He, exactly. You know, and that's some of the same kind of Japanese warrior mentality kind of stuff. Like they really want to get after it and they've been coached really well, you know? Um, so on an offensive rebound, we're probably only sending two because of our my fear of getting get getting caught in transition where they're turning the ball around they get the rebound now we're at a disadvantage if we try to send more you know and i've i've right. toyed with the idea of you know obviously sending all guys and trying to get it but the japanese teams you know rebound so well and, and some of it too is like we're also preparing for our guys going to the u.s you know at the same time you know, and, and be able to kind of play at that level. And a lot of the teams are going to be more athletic than us anyway. Right. You know, so if they're going to be more athletic as us and be able to get rebounds over us, like we can't be just constantly clash, crashing the glass with so many guys because the same thing is going to happen. Um, so it still kind of works out, you know, and, 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 and for me, like, because we were playing in kind of two different styles, you know, I want to try to keep things as the same as possible you know, because they have to adjust. And I don't want to go like, Hey, we're playing only this week, but we're getting ready to go to, you know, LA in, you know, a month, but we're going to change things after we play over We're going to change how we, you know, I don't want to do that because like, it's just right. confusing kids and we don't play enough or practice enough um, to be able to kind of make, all right, we're going to change this whole, whole, how we do things. Um, so I try to do as much that is going to translate on both sides. Like it. 
Um, what did you like specifically for this team? What did you think were your advantages going into the game? Like we, we talk about the general process of scouting. Uh, you do mention, you know, pace you want to play at. You have a little bit of size. What did you really think was going to win you the game going into it? Uh, I thought maybe, well, again, it was the ball screen stuff, but trying to get in, into the paint and penetrate. Um, we shot the ball fairly well in this game. Um, and I was a little bit worried too, because one of our other guys that was kind of one of our shooters was hurt as well, but he played hurt. Um, right. and he did not have a good game. Uh, but one of our other guys stepped up. Um, but I, I thought, you know, that we would be able to, we, we create problems on the defensive side because we're, we're pack line and no one in Japan's pack line. I won't say no one, but, but a lot or not, it's really high and deny you guys on the Island and they really work on that individual defense and they're really good at it. Um, you know, they, they work on footwork. I mean, like I said, there's 370 days of the year and they're having four hour practices. Well, one hour, first hour of Japanese basketball practices, no ball. You know, okay. I, I might be exaggerating, but there are some of it that are like that. And it's defensive footwork and it's all his footwork drills and all those other things. And so like, I sit there and watch, it's like, I, I, I want to, I, I do, I want to go to the practice, kind of see how they do their defensive footwork because it's so good. They're so quick. They can get in front you know um and so i thought on a defensive side we would have that advantage as far as like you know teams having to adjust how we play you know as far as a pack line being in a gap their guys still killed us you know as far as getting in the paint um but i think it's it it kind of throws teams off a little bit about that's just how we play that um i know at, at a younger age like we also have under 15 and under 15 it really throws off teams because they're so used to the high deny try to backdoor your guy and all this other stuff. And, you know, now I'm trying to drive and there's a guy there. Yeah. No, we're in the gap. Sorry. We're packed up. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, in, in game stuff uh, on your bench, do you have assistance or yourself tracking anything? Uh, and what, if, if not, what is important to you say like on a box score that you would look at as like a, a stat that would really stick out and tell you what you would need to influence? So we, yeah, we do have one guy on the bench who does the translation. So he's like our operations guy and he, he, he's always there because I need him <laughs> to translate, but I, you know, he's statting, but the thing I'm always asking about is turnovers and offensive rebounds, offensive rebounds. We're giving up. Those right. are two things I'm the most worried about in, in every game, you know, and in this game, we were actually up in offensive rebounds in the first half, which of course I was ecstatic about. Um, but then the second half, they got a few more and, and you know, it kind of changed the tide of the game for them to, and we had some, some, like I said, bad turnovers against that press that kind of, um, turned the game for them. Um, so those are the two things that I'm, you know, whether it's, it's the same thing, even with, um, I'm coaching St. Mary's, it's the same thing I'm looking at is I just don't like giving up offensive rebounds, um, and us turning the ball over. Um, you know, if we can limit those things, I think we have and a good chance. So what would a, a halftime look like with you? Like, let's say you're taking it and too many turnovers or you're giving up too many offensive rebounds. How do you affect change? Is it, are, are you a yeller and screamer? Or are you like, are you curt with your guys? Is what's the implementation of change in there? Yeah, I'm not much of a, a yeller. The game before, like I said, the day before we were playing so bad, I wasn't yelling, but I was pretty on them about like these guys are just outplaying you like that's that's all it is right you know, it's the same with offensive rebounding right it's they're outplaying you for it it's not talent it's not i mean there is some skill to it but it's you know this is why you know they're they're taking it to you um so in this game it was like i don't know we were down six you know and we we're in a good place to me down six against you know the type of team we're playing um, so I'm trying to like rally them and keep them going. Like, Hey, this is, we're in the right spot. You know, we're all in striking distance, you know, let's continue to do what we're doing. Let's focus on, you know, one taking care of the ball, but also like limit them to one shot. That's, you know, if we can continue to do that, limit the one shot, you know, we're going to give ourselves a, a, a better opportunity. So that's where we're kind of focusing on. Um, we were, you know, later in the game, we started to adjust that, you know, and, I, and I, I looked at a little bit in the first half and we did it in the second half was we found a matchup that we were, we wanted to go at. 
um, that really helped us in the fourth quarter when we got the match, finally got the matchup we wanted. Um, they had a, a big freshman kid um, who I don't know that had a lot of experience. We knew about him. We knew him coming in because he's actually local around here. We hadn't seen him play, right. um, but we knew he was big. He could shoot. Um, and at one point we went small against him and then we just isolated him and, and we were able to take a pretty big advantage on it and help us kind of come back in the game. Cause I think we went down 16 and then brought it back to two. Um, and by that point that coach had pulled him out. Um, but that's where we started to kind of make some adjustments with those matchups. Love it. Uh, you talked a little bit about like how your ball screen oriented offensively on the defensive side. Uh, are you playing only like one type of coverage or are you switching among a few? And then as sort of a follow up to it, uh, when will you throw sort of audibles in terms of coverages uh, if they're not working out in those games? On the defensive side? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for us defensively, we were pretty much just going to switch it all. Okay. Um, we felt like because of our size, like we had one of our smaller guys that was out there and he's about five, seven. Um, so he was smaller than their, like their bigs. Um, so we we're trying to figure out in practices, like how do we get that kind of triple switch? How do we get him to get him right. off of him as he rolls the rim, get him off of him. Um, and as kind of the game went on, um, they didn't really attack that so much. Um, we didn't see them attacking that so much. So we didn't feel like we had to adjust it um, whether we, you know, stop switching or not. So we stuck with it for pretty much the whole game. It's just kind of, you know, and in, in our, in our big that was playing, you know, it wasn't so mobile, but he was able to kind of stay in front of guys. And so we kind of just stuck with it to say, okay, this is, this is working for us, you know, for the most part, you know, they still were able to get some buckets out of it, but um, that's kind of how we, how I, I, I was looking at it love it i have two more before i get into a little bit of film so the, sure. the first one um sorry the first one is um since you're switching will you give everybody the same responsibility of knowing all of their personnel or do you allow like your first five knows their first five better than anybody else or like there, if I'm guarding Chris today, I only really need to know Chris. How does that work for you? Does it, does everybody sort of have to know everybody or? Yeah. I mean, yes. In a, in a game that we know the personnel, yes. In this game, we didn't know the personnel um, because like I said, the players that were playing weren't playing and the players that were playing weren't playing, you know, so we didn't know exactly, you know, and so one, a couple of their guys really beat us on, uh, especially late on some threes, um, that, um, you know, we gave up some open shots that had we known or had we adjusted and, and, and talked to the kids, we may not have given up, you know, and for me, like, you know, like I said, the big kid that we kind of took advantage of, well, he hit two threes right. and I had, I hadn't said that I knew that. And I, after, you know, after he hit the first one, I was like, man, I never told these guys, this guy can shoot. You know, so he hit the first one and then he hit one late, you know, and then by the second one, like they knew that they, they kind of they had to get out to him. Um, but, you know, I, I know there was one late in the game, too, where, you know, the, again, their best player, you know, he's pretty good. He, he got in the lane and all five guys just went at him and he just kicked to the cross of the corner. And our guy was way late to get there and he drained right. it and, and, you know, that put us down and, then, and that kind of sealed it. Um, or the exact play actually yeah right and so because i mean that kid's a dynamic player and, and those guys were just like so worried about him getting the lane again um so that's where kind of our defense broke down our, our principles broke down right where he should have been at least close to the shooter even if he knew he was a shooter or not um and the same thing happened uh i, I want to say a couple of plays before where again one of our shorter players is out there and he was the one that was actually hurt he couldn't contest the three so the guy just shot it right over him um, so it's unfortunate how it goes, but you know, that's again, trying to keep our kids disciplined and, and one, you got to contain the one guy that's getting in the lane, but also don't overhelp and, you know, trust that your other guys are going to help you. Right. 
Uh, and then the last one, I, I sort of ask this one all the time too. Uh, do you do anything that is sort of like an evaluation of your game plan or your scout that sort of compares your your results to what you uh, had created for your guys and evaluates it? I mean, I know a lot of people will do post-game film and show like errors, but I'm wondering if you do anything that sort of judges like, hey, I gave them this and we – you know, we should have been doing this instead here, or this was right on. We just didn't execute very well. Are you doing anything of that sorts at all? Uh, from time to time, like, it, again, for like, for St. Mary's, we would do that because I'm with our guys, you know, five, six days a week. Right. So we'll go back in, we'll watch film, we'll talk about it. Um, and then we'll say like what we did well, what we didn't well, or, you know, some of the things, you know, or what I didn't do well. You know, cause I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. Just tell the kids like, man, I missed that one up. Um, <laughs> happens, <laughs> but and it happens, you know, and, or I, I put the wrong guy in or whatever it is, or, you know, you know what though? I think, uh, and, and I'll say this to the end of the world, players will always respect you more when you're like, Nope, that right. one was me. As opposed to like, I'm around a lot of coaches that try to talk their way out of mistakes. And it's like, dude, everybody knows you screwed up. Relax. It's okay. It <laughs> yeah. Happens. Like, yeah yeah and, and you know and and the same like one i want the kids to know i'm I'm human right like i don't expect for you know i want you to do as best you can and sure it'd be great if it's perfect you know but we're gonna make mistakes and it's part of the game yeah you know and let's learn from it and move on you know and i want them to know too it's like it's okay to make a mistake like i we don't want to but you know we're trying to limit them as much as possible so like i'm you know i'm i'm, I'm open with our guys like hey, i messed that up you know, that we should have done that or whatever. Right. Um, and, and to be honest with you, what I actually did mess up on this one was like, I had a paper scout for both the teams we were playing. So two high level teams were playing, but I didn't want to give them both at the same time because they would either mix them up or not read it, whatever it is. So I gave them the, the, the one for the game, the first game on the Saturday. And I'm so, to me, upset about how we played. I forgot to give them the paper one for the second day until oh, right no. before we got into the gym. <laughs> no, no. I really did do this work, but uh, here it is now. Yeah, I was like, oh, <laughs> dang it. here you go, guys. So now I'm going like, hey, guys, like, oh, this guy, this guy, this guy. Um, but then again, it turned out like the guys that were, like I was worried about, two of them weren't there. I was like, now we got to adjust. And now it's again on the fly. Like, how do we, what, what can we figure out with these guys that are on here now that we don't know? Um, so that was kind of, you know, it was a, an adjustment for us. And like I said, two of those kids, you know, actually three of them had, had really good games against us and, and, and did some stuff, did some damage against us. I hear you. All right. Well, I'm, uh, I'm basically wound down with all the, uh, the question portion. Let's move right. to the video unless uh, anybody wants to jump in with something. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And like I said, I'll play each clip two or three times. Uh, first time, just kind of like one to, to flow through. Second time, I'll fumble through a description for anybody who's listening. And then third time, it's all you. Uh, take it away. Tell me, you know, what you see what you like, what you don't like, wrinkles of sets, anything along those lines. Just want to have a film session with you, so to speak. The first one's kind of an easy one. It's uh, your first play of the game. It's a spread ball screen attacking from the offensive left slot. Uh, doesn't look like you get much out of it. Get a little pump fake, and then you get a corner cut happening. Uh, the pass gets fumbled. He recovers and gets fouled. So I'll play that again from the beginning. Uh, like I said, spread ball screen, offensive left side. How's that playback speed for you? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit choppy, but I got it. Okay. Uh, and then uh, tacks off of it, and they get back in front. We up fake. Uh, you get a duck in from the corner, and then you get a little contact through the finish here. So talk me through it. What are you trying to establish? Who are you going at? How do you feel your execution is? So what we were looking at here, as you can see, this guy pops out here. Is Could we draw that we knew that that they're, they're going to kind of hedge like that on that ball screen right and so we're looking at can we draw this guy out um and the guy that's the playing the big right there was supposed to be our other player uh at the time like he was supposed to be that ball screener um right. who's you know a, a bigger offensive threat from there um so that's where we're first looking 
this kid's getting his shirt pulled ridiculous yeah yeah so that, that that's pretty much how the game went that's how that's kind of to me japanese basketball is if you know so there's an opportunity there right he doesn't see him but he doesn't seal him to get the ball right there when they kind of try to switch it back so that's where we're trying to look at is can we get our point guard outside try to get him downhill uh, and so then he tries to attack here. Now, what didn't happen and should have happened, our guy ducks in on the backside, is that they were supposed to do an exchange on the backside. So either like a hammer screen in there um, or just even a pin down. Like I, I leave it to them to kind of communicate with each other at that point to like what they're trying to figure out. Either uh, one of neither of those. Right? <laughs> yeah. So neither of those happened. So they just stood there. So of course the defense is loaded up on him, and, you know, he tries to make a late cut. Um, you know, the other thing that we're always trying to look for is that backside lift coming up, depending on what that defense is doing. But you can see like our guy was open. Our roller was open. He just didn't seal him. Um, and so I think we kind of panic a little bit there and um, we get a, a, that weak side cut and, um, you know, credit to them. The guy's right there for it. So I got a couple questions. First one, sure. you're uh, so spread or shake, pick and roll, whatever you want to call it. You're single side uh, where the tag would be coming from. Uh, you lift fairly early and you keep above the free throw line by design, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, and then the cut you, you mentioned could be a hammer, could be a, just a straight exchange, could be a pin down and lift, whatever the case might be. But then there ends up being a cut here. Is the cut part of your principles as one more option, or is this just trying to make a good basketball play? He's, yeah, he, he's just trying to make a play. Because what we're looking at is when he comes up that screen is to throw back to the shake, right, and see if right. we can get our guy in the post when he turns around. Um, but we didn't get it there. And that 36 right there is a pretty good shooter. So that's where we're looking at um, to get the ball there to him as well, if we can get a shot there. Um, but we didn't go either way. And then instead he tried to drive it um, and then got stuffed. And, you know, then they're there. We try to make a play from there. Um, so that's not necessarily a principle. Like we might do some like 45 cuts on the backside sometimes early, you know, before that kind of screens, as that screen's going 45 from the backside and then have the guy lift out of it um, right there. We might do it. Um, you know, and again, there's nothing that's predetermined. We're kind of letting the kids go off and feel. Um, but none of those things happened. So, none of it. So it was just, I'll, I'll tell you, you said very casually how uh, number 50 didn't duck in or get a seal on the, yeah. the hedge return. This yeah. is one of my biggest pet peeves. <laughs> like, I run a lot of spread. And, uh, you know, like sometimes some of the guys are calling it drag for me. That's fine, whatever. Uh, some are just using the fist sign, whatever, but like anytime we get into it and like we switch a lot over here and, and when we go down to the States, they switch a lot too. So you end up with a mismatch a lot of the time. And what ends up happening nine out of 10 times is that guard's going to try and play one-on-one -on -one instead of throwing like that post entry is gone. But yeah. on that one out of 10 times that he actually throws it in, I see a little stealing that pass because a big can't hold a seal or get a seal. And it's driving me insane. Uh -huh. I'm like, do you want to score the ball? Like, yeah. like what, yeah. what is happening now? And, yeah. and they, they start to complain like, Oh, it's becoming a guards game. Nobody wants to throw <laughs> like, well, you're not stealing. I don't know what you want. Like, All right. We're going to get you a layup. How about that? Yeah. Like, um, yeah. Yeah. For this guy, he, he's still learning though. So he just came to Japan. He was in Malaysia. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And so he's Japanese. And so uh, he just moved back. And so he's, he's only been playing with us for maybe two months, you know, so it's all, all, all new to him, you know, and, you know, he's got some skill for sure. So we're trying to build that up and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how he kind of progresses. Love it. Uh, the next one is a double drag while they're still hedging. It's one of your earlier sets in the game. So 77 double drag, whatever you want to call it. They hedge off of the first, you continue along, you get the second one, they get under, we throw back for a semi-contested three. Talk to me about execution options. Talk to me about why you're running it at this point, what what you like about it, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so on this one, uh, obviously we're trying to get that roll, but we're looking for, a you know, potentially on that roll and then that pop 
our corner guy lifts a little bit too far on that, the, the left corner there. Um, so we're looking here and trying to just pull that defense out and seeing one, if we can get our point guard, um, again, downhill, our, our now strong side guy lifted up too. We didn't want him lifting up either. Um, so the backside guy lifted up, which is fine. He just came too far. Um, but at this point, once he comes off, see if we can get our roll and then we go to our pop. And at that point we can go, he's got a shot. If he's got it, he's got a drive. If he's got it, but he can go pick and roll on the backside. He can go hand off to the backside. Um, I mean, we've run some like kind of pistol action out of that too, where our point guard would go across and then go to that strong side corner, hand it off. Turns uh, into hand off ball screen. It, you're, you're into, like it. Yeah. So we have a, 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 a few different options they can do from that. Um, we knew that this guy, like he kind of plays our three, but was playing our four because the other guy was out. Right. Um, but I know he can shoot. So I was happy with this shot and he, he put it in. So a uh, couple questions yeah. or things that I've noticed first. Uh, I just want to point this out. N no seal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but beyond that, you did mention that you are okay with this player popping up, lifting up but just not as high. Uh, I find that interesting. Yeah. What, what would be an ideal amount of lift for you? Because for me, I'm always concerned about on, uh, on this throwback pass, the spacing so that 38 can attack. Yeah. So I wanted him lower, like kind of where your arrow is maybe to give him some space. Well, he, like, you know, uh, we're trying to get the spacing. So what we really are trying to do is get 38 at the top. Like our point guard wants to drag him out further and then go back to the, you know, pop at the top. So we're always telling him pop to top, pop to top, you know, where Eleven's coming up now, he probably is in the right spot. You know, if, you know, the 38 the top, caught at the top. So that's why he came so far but he's not seeing kind of, you know, he needs more space here because he's, he's just brought his defender there. Um, yeah. So we, we'd want to have Levin right now lower to give him some space, you know, where you had your arrow initially down there. Um, yeah. Somewhere up in there, you know, because then we can kind of quickly move into a handoff or quickly move into a, you know, throw the ball and just screen again um, and have our big man kind of get out of that way, you know, filter out on the backside probably or in the dunker spot of it what do we got next uh we've got guarding their under out this is a neat little set that they were running here so for anybody who's listening it's almost like a like i don't want to call it a box formation it's almost like a triangle really where the two low guys are block and outside block the two top guys are just outside of the nail along the free throw line and basically they enter to the strong side post and it turns into like almost like an elevator screen where uh, the, the gentleman who is the outside block or the weak side block pops to the top in your own language uh, and then looks for a three over the top, which he hits there. So uh, do you have the set? How do you think you guarded it? What would you do different, if anything? Uh, you know, talk to me about it. So this was early on, so we didn't adjust. They adjusted later because we they ran it again. Um, and what we were trying to almost like switch, 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 like they knew those two guys out. So the, the guy guarding 99 would have popped out. The other guy would have bumped his guy over, right? With a bit of bump, bump. And then the, the, the big kid would have jumped out at, at that. And so that's right. what they, they ended up doing later in the game. It's a good Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Yeah. So we ran something similar. I, I noticed that you do. Yeah. So it's all it's it's almost the same. It is it's a box, but they kind of do it like you said, like an elevator, and just and we kind of run it more as a stagger. Yeah. What's so, uh? So I mean, would you always switch from the inside, or would this ever be a lock and trail based upon coverage type deal? Yeah, based on coverage, again, like we're, you know, because of unlimited practice we have, you know, there's so many, you know, we had, we got to kind of stick with what we have, what we've been working on. Okay, we've right. been working on switching, so let's let's just switch this and, and you know, kind of figure it out from there. Um, but it's a great set, and they, their kids, you know, their kids hit shots. 
uh, one of my former guests actually one time said, everybody is a junior college coach. They don't know it yet in terms of preparation time and in terms of how long do you have kids in your program and all that. Like, it's just like you mentioned, it's like you find something that works and you stick with it until it doesn't work any longer. It's, it's just kind of the best thing that most of us can do right now. Right. Um, next one I have, sorry, let me get this out of the way. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. We have, this is uh, your under out that I think is fairly similar. I, I put them back to back. So looks like a box set. We put it in. There's your stagger away. Uh, you actually end up with the long two on it. Talk to me about, uh, you know, how you're able to utilize what you do to be able to change the way that you were guarding that from the first time you saw it to, to later. And then talk to me about the quality of shot. Do you have anything where you care about long twos versus I hate threes. long twos. <laughs> and I tell them that all the time. I hate long twos. And I tell them, put your foot on the line. This is the worst shot you can take. <laughs> uh, so no, I'm not, I'm not happy with that shot at all. Uh, and he's off balance and all these other things. And yeah, I say, so when, you, when you guys become, so yeah, when you guys become, <laughs> <laughs> when you guys become Kobe, then be Kobe. Okay. Otherwise both feet in, land on the ground. <laughs> uh, I tell them that often. I mean, even on that screen, number nine didn't set a very good screen. Um, right there initially, like he's yeah. facing the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, our next guy, you know, gets him open, you know. Um, so, you know, depending, see, he got him open there, but I think he, sh he should have ran to the wing. And then, then from there, right, um, <clears throat> you know, we'll do a couple things, you know, potentially what we'll do if nine isn't so far down, the second screener would actually screen again. Right. So then nine would pop up. Ah, yeah, I get you. So like that's as the, coming off, he just adds in one more. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, that's the second option. And then this would pop up type deal. Yeah. And so we get a second action out of that and then we can swing. And then where he's at, you can see our point guard who inbound the ball swinging back around. Um, Right, he's, he's going to swing back probably towards the wing again, and then they can go into another ball screen, handoff, whatever they want to do from there. Wow. Um, that's kind of the concept. No, we didn't we didn't execute it. We took a, a off balance long two, <laughs> which which you love. Huh. You're, you're very happy. every day. I'm telling you guys, please take off balance long twos. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, like I, I said, though, he he he's a pretty good shooter, you know, and and he was hurt. He was like that, that kid was a warrior. Like he could barely walk. But for him, he had played um, Japanese high school basketball. And in the tournament, this team he played destroyed his team. So he was kind of like, I need to play this game. I have to play this game. Um, gotcha. And yeah, so he was he was not going to back down. Love it. Uh, this one is a sideline out of bounds. It's an elevator set out of a box set that you guys were running. Uh, so there is the low man on the strong side is setting a corner pin and then coming through the elevator. Real typical elevator type set. Uh, you don't get the shot out of it by, because they switch even though the one guy tries to get through. So two come to the ball. Uh, he attacks and shoots kind of semi-contested <laughs> mid-range two instead of throwing it into the block. So I'm sure there's some discussion there, but talk to me about uh, uh, wrinkles. Talk to me about execution. Uh, you know, what, what do you see here? I, I love this set, by the way. I mean, I, I've used it myself to be honest. Yeah. So later, later in the game, we actually got the other guy open. Uh, maybe no, sorry. It was a different game. We ran the same set in a different game, um, but we got the, the other guy open because they, they were so concerned about the guy coming through the elevator is that the corner man ended up getting open. So they end up switching it and we got through there. Of course, that's, we're looking for a shot there. Um, and depending on where it's at, we might send it almost like a horn set at that point where the kind of the open side is going to set a ball screen. So now he's coming uh, on this one, he'd be going to his right off a ball screen um, and same kind of concepts, pick and pop on the back side or the, the left guy was going to pop like he was. Um, but then again, like right here, we take a, contested um i'm okay with that elbow jumper but it'll get us off balance and um not the shot we really wanted to get i don't know what the shot clock was at at that point it might have been late that's why he took it but uh you're big ducked in for once it's, it's, yeah it's yeah. like beat him. are you looking for it 
Yeah, he's looking for it, and then and then they get it, and that's some of it too, right? It's like, and that's on me. Like our kids, just you know, they they don't look in there either, you know. So sometimes these kids are like, "Why am I going to do this if you're not going to throw me the ball?" Yeah, you know. And so that's something we have to work on. It's like, hey, if this guy's got the position down there, give it to him. And that was the matchup that we ended up going at later in the game was those two guys under the basket. I thought that was one that we could take advantage of. Love it. Uh, the next one is one I ask all the time. It's a one pass advance to the offensive wide left slot or offensive left wing. He takes kind of a one dribble pull up. Uh, the question is transition threes, yay or nay for you? And uh, if yes, uh, you know, who, who can take it and why? Uh, transition threes, yay. This particular shot, nay, because he was like a sidestep three. I don't know why he did that. Uh, like this kid can can really shoot. Like in a high school game, he scored like 50. Oh, um, yeah, so he can really shoot, but he's really, really streaky. And so for him to get going, like I was happy for him to hit the shot because if, if we can get him going, right, he's can a, a bunch more might start to fall. So on this – you know, like for him to, to, to take a three, like I'm okay with it. Uh, he has no advantage going to the basket. Um, I think he should just kind of caught it, take one dribble and pull up, but maybe he felt like he needed to get more rhythm. I don't know. Wasn't the, the you know, it wasn't the, <clears throat> the shot I prefer. Um, but you can see the defenders right there on top of him though. Like he was ready oh, for it's it. It's a big time shot. I mean, that's a good make for sure. Yeah. But that defender was ready for him to do that. And he's, he's, he's right up on him. So you got enough space for him. You know, I think, you know, to me, again, we're, we're running wide lanes here. So he wouldn't have to do that if he was running the, the, the lane wide enough. Like he would have been catching almost on that spot instead of he ran a narrow lane and was dribbling, you know, further in and then had to um, get, him, get some space out. So transition threes, you say yes overall. Can anybody shoot them? And if not, what sort of like criteria needs to be met for you to give them the green light to be able to do it? Um, the guys that can shoot threes, shoot threes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love right? it. Uh, like, again, if I'm around these guys more, so like for, for our high school, like we used to do like, you know, green light, yellow light, red light kind of shooting stuff. Like you, you got you to gotta meet a mark to be able to kind of shoot these types of shots. Um, I haven't done it with like a club, like a, we don't, we don't again, practice much, but the, you know, I let them know who, 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 who's a good shooter. They know what I'm like, this guy can shoot, this guy can shoot, this guy can shoot, you know? So on this team, there were, there were probably three guys that'd be like, Hey, you take that shot. No problem. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cry over that one. Um, you know, a couple other guys, if they took it because, you know, it was an open shot, I'd be okay with it. If it's an open shot, the type of shot he took no, like there's only a couple of guys that would say, okay that's somewhat an acceptable shot so for if somebody is taking one that is not an acceptable one to you how do you convey that message <laughs> <laughs> hey johnny that's a bad shot <laughs> <laughs> not the one <laughs> no and that's and uh, no it seems like most of the time is no yay you know like he wasn't supposed to but then he makes it yeah. Um, but like, I, I, you know, I'm not in a, in a kid's grill. Like I'll, when they come off the court, like, man, that wasn't a good shot. We need to get a better shot. You know, we want to get a higher percentage shot or it's like a lot of the kids that say, just drive the ball. Yeah. Stuff's going to happen. If you drive the ball, just go to the rim. Please. Just go to the, yeah. I can't go believe to the how much that is dying. Like I, I I'm watching teams. Sometimes it's like, Hey, we're zero for seven on the last seven shots. Maybe you need to go to the rim. Maybe I don't even need to say this. Just go to the basket. Go see it go through. Yeah. And that's what I, you know, I say to a lot of our guys, you know, because like, hey, it's, you know, I'm I'm all for you. Try to, you know, try trying to trying to get that shot. But if it's not going, go to the rim. Go get fouled. Go make yeah. a play for somebody. Yeah. You know, and and you know, I yeah, it's just there's there's a lot of kids that want to take a lot of threes and um maybe not enough practice at it. Uh, this one is, so basically they're in, uh, some ball screen action. I'll let it play. They set a step up, it gets rejected. And then there's a backdoor cut from the two side, which is the original help side of the floor. Uh, guarding that backdoor cut with your low man is kind of a tough action because it's your help man and you're not high helping here. 
uh, you know, talk to me in an ideal world. How would you like to play this? Uh, you know, what, what, what do you see? What would you do different in this whole set? So I would say our nail defender is not on the nail, right? He, he should be over for the top, the top defender, help defender should be over. Um, so interesting. You are our full cover the nail type. No, no, we're not right? going to fully be there because it, it's like 12 there was killing us anyway. But I, I thought that like we try to just stunt and get back. Um, and I would have had him where he's at right now, probably one more step in. Okay. Um, so that there's a little bit more He The, the guy driving in is going to see a little bit more help before he gets there. You know, and then we'll stunt at him and then get back out to the shooter and then have the low man kind of step up. Now, probably the rotation of what I would have saw is the the backside guys rotating over. Um, In the green shoes here. Yeah. And yeah, he should have rotated over. And then our other opposite guard would have been guarding two. Ready for that rotation. Talk to me a little bit about the ball screen on the step up angle with the loaded corner. What are you guys like? What's the objective usually in terms of how you're trying to take care of it? How we're defending that? Yeah. Well, so he should have like, so because we're going to switch, you know, he got flat footed here and got rejected and we're trying to get into him and try to push him towards the screen and then go under the screen and catch the, catch him on the switch. Okay. You know, and so he got flat footed here um, and then just got beat going the other way. And you can see too, like, again, I didn't think they took advantage of like our smallest guys guarding one of their, the guy that's setting the screen is one of yeah. our, our smallest player out there. And they didn't try to go out. I haven't going to throw it in. I saw that too. So yeah. would, it be, would it be fair to say in an ideal world, he's up, but he's also a little bit at this angle trying to force the screen force the ball handler in this direction right towards the switch and he would go under that screen and that's stepping up for the switch and then after he's going to get underneath like you're saying yeah gotcha yeah uh, uh, uh let's go next one i got about four more you're good on time sure. yeah yeah no problem um this is the double drag set again there uh this is Second half, so we're going the other direction. Offensive right slot moving to the offensive left slot. Uh, they hedge off of the first one again. We roll our first in the double drag, but we don't roll it to the basket. We set a stagger away. So we get to the offensive left side of the floor, stagger away. We're looking for a jump shot. We uh, front rim it, but it's a wide open shot. Love the look. Talk to me about you know wrinkles. Talk to me about why you've decided to throw this in instead of just the normal 77 or double drag that you were using before and how do you feel you executed yeah so this is again <clears throat> a lot of these calls are i'm, I'm letting the guards make the call on okay. what they want to get uh again this is a shooter um that we wanted to get off of that um so yeah like we said we ran that drag before earlier and so then we wanted to this you know a, a drag away a uh, double drag away uh and so what we're looking for as he comes off um is is can we get that open shot um on the wing and if he and if he curls back into it, it's the same thing i said on that stagger inbound is right there's that let me screen on. screen so we uh maybe this curls through or twirls it whatever you want to call it and then if, if he does then it's that same action we did before yeah second guy is going to come back around and look for it himself again Love um it. but and these are I'm sorry, Chris. These are not calls for you. This is your guards are handling this. They're so they're playing. well. They're calling. I'm not. I didn't make this call. They made the call. As he came down, that point guard made the call. Hey, this is where we'll go. Um, so I give I give our kids a lot of freedom to make the calls. Now, late in the game, you know, I'll I'll start making um, might make some of the calls myself, but I'm going to let them kind of try to figure it out and 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 use their own basketball knowledge to try to find advantages so what percentage of the time would you be interfering and in making the call versus what you're describing right now like if 20 percent, 20 percent. so it's it's probably only like if you're seeing something that you really want to exploit but other yeah. than that you're letting them create and, and get in the flow right so like i said we've, we've saw that a matchup we wanted to go to as i said no we're going to run this we're going to run this and we give it to this guy and we're going to you know and that was I think after a free throw. So during a free throw, I told them that. 
this is what we're going to go towards. Um, and they were, they were able to execute it. So this one is kind of getting into a little bit of play after the play stuff. My notes is changing to the tag plus a wing ball screen, but basically there's a high ball screen. We're going towards a single side, which is now about to become a double side. And when, as it becomes a double side, we set uh, a hammer or a back screen, I guess, really. Uh, and that back screen comes, brings that player to the original strong side of the floor. And, and we, we miss it right there. Another, another ball screen action here. And then we get nothing out of the original ball screen. So we make the wing entry. And then we, we screen them off the wing, almost like we were making a shuffle cut. They come to the offensive right elbow. They shoot a pretty good jump shot. Uh, we don't actually end up making this one. But talk to me about, you know, I imagine there's a little bit of breakdown. This isn't the original spread that we're supposed to be in. But talk to me about, like, changing the tag and play after the play type stuff and uh, continuity after the first action. What are you teaching your guys and, and what do you see here? Yeah, so they like initially what I'm seeing is that like our, our guard that brought the ball down, like we weren't set, and so their guys on the wrong side of the court, and so they were not in position when we, if we, even when we started, uh, which is something I try to make sure that like you got to make sure you guys are in the right spots. You know, again, a team that speeds them up. You know, um, and for some of this too, like some of these guys hadn't played together, you know, for like a practice maybe. Um, so. We get that initial ball screen and, they, and right now now they're just making reads now what i saw like i said before is our guard misses that um that hammer screen where the guy just decides to cut across um if you can roll it back there um Malik. so he misses right there right. they set us a, 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 a you know a screen right there on the back side as they set that uh, top ball screen and he misses him here um the, the kid in the blue shoes as he comes back to set that screen again oh yeah okay that's right he misses that that's what i saw when i first watched this is he missed that because that hedge defender came out and he wasn't ready to kind of pop back immediately um and so then we get into kind of i don't know what they're going to do it looks like you know like we might in in a transition situation run like a pistol action right there where it's a handoff and then ball screen um but we got none of that and so then it turned into this and they were just kind of playing basketball at that point and got a good shot out of it yeah it's not a bad shot at all by any means uh do you do you do any sort of drills where you're looking at changing the tag specifically or uh where you're looking at the play after the play like hey it's broken down now let's make it look like something that we know yeah so a lot of our sets are just you know because we, we have so little you know little practice time that you know we want to have more is that it's a lot of it's like one or one or two passes maybe one screen two screens and then play you know and so we're doing a lot of just motion kind of concepts and um you know at, at that point we're you know at this point they're just playing they're there there was no um set anything to do is like let's you know they, they got to a point like let's let's just play basketball and find it and try to get a shot and they, they did right right um next one i think i only have two more actually from here uh next one is kind of i like this a lot because it's uh the shuffle cut action i, I call it where where we set this away screen sort of turns into the cut from the offense of other wing or wide slot uh this is always kind of a tough action to guard i was at a game today where it basically was the only thing they they ran and guys didn't really know what to do uh but i think we get a little idea of what you were talking about what you run where your handoff turns into some pistol action on the side there so uh, talk to me about how you see uh, yourself guarding this and, and what you think uh, and what you would do any, any different, if at all. Uh, and just before we do that, I'll, I'll give the breakdown for anybody who's listening. We move the ball to the offensive right wide slot or wing. We set an away screen, kind of get this shuffle cut coming over top. After the shuffle cut, uh, we do get sort of a, a quick duck in and a reversal uh, you could call it playing on an empty side now. So he takes it to the offensive left side on a handoff. Uh, but then the gentleman who is the offensive right slot comes and sets a ball screen. And now our spacing's kind of messed up. 
they swing the ball to the other corner and on the drive, they kind of run into help and shoot a contested layup. So tell me what you see. How, how did you play it? Would you do anything different? Uh, you know, how similar is it to the action you've described that you're running all of that? Uh, I think the, the one thing that we would change here is that that initial one should have been, uh, they, they didn't communicate the switch early. Right here. Right here. Yeah. And so he starts to try to go over it and they kind of know the other guy is like, Oh no, I got to switch that. And, you know, they probably could have taken advantage of that. Um, but we ended up switching it. And then throughout the rest of it, you can see our, where our principles were just kind of, uh, yeah. He's not supposed to be that low. Much of a shooter. <laughs> <laughs> he's not supposed to be that low, but I guess he's like, yeah, this guy's not going to shoot. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he does cover up that, you know, that cut right there because he does play so low. Right. Um, that's not normally how we would play it um, because it, right. Again, they're not prepared for that switch. And so that he would have had an advantage there. And we actually played a team. I think it was the day before one of the other teams we played that was running a lot of that. Um, and we're talking, we're talking through it. Like you got to switch that and communicate it, get under it. Um, and so the rest of the way you can start to see that they, um, really start to kind of pick up on those switches and the other team doesn't really, um, try to figure out, you know, where they could get some advantage out of it. Cause to me, like on this so, switch, right. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Uh, on this switch right here, I would have thrown it back to 34 and let him go to work on the smaller player. Yeah. Same 34 is about six, four. And they should, I would have just dumped it into them right there. I also don't think I would have turned this into a pistol action. I was just going to say, I think I would have left this as two on an empty side, leave the other three on the other side, and then yeah. just play against this switch, right? Because, yeah. like, yeah. if he rolls that in, I mean, that kid's good luck. <laughs> like, exactly. Exactly. He's, he's hugging him, right? He knows. Yeah. <laughs> he he's knows like, that. Please, that don't, please don't throw it down here because I'm in <laughs> Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's what I would have been looking for, you know, and that's what we try to do. Like we don't see a lot of switching, um, but we'll talk about that in practice because we're practicing switching. It's like, Hey, take advantage of it. Find the match. If you can get, of course it ends up, you know, I don't know, eight out of 10 times a guy takes a, a long three against a guard on a big and he takes a long three rather than trying to go the other way around. Let me ask you about your, what becomes your two side on the third side of the floor really. Is he as far in as you would like? No, he's is, too far. Is he a take two? Like, should he be closing both of this and then both of these, and then he takes the second one? Or what would what would be ideal for you? I would probably you? have them almost in a line. I okay. But, so like know, like an eye right there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So the, the the low man's gone too far, right? And I think do they kick it here? Right, they kick it to that corner, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh, he got too far. So if, if he did, so if 12 did beat him going right, right, then the low man would have been there. He would have, he would have rotated to that spot. And then we got that guy guarding two. Does that make sense? So right there, if yeah. he had driven, yeah. he would have picked him up, but then he was too low there to give him that pass. And it was a bad pass because otherwise he's going to shoot that. Right. Right. If he can get him on, in, on target, he's probably going to shoot that. And we're in a bad position, make another drive and, um, I didn't see that last rotation there. It just, uh, the guy that was low, the green shoes ends yeah. up. Yeah. So he goes out there and then the and guy then, now that's, that should right there stunt. And then the big man there should step in front. And then the other guy, the small guy's guarding too at that point. That's what, we're, that's what I, I'd hope it's he. Gotcha. And then the last one that I have, uh, I just called it roller principles, but uh, I was actually kind of impressed at uh, how your, your big rolled him all the way down and then got a seal and then sort of semi gore him uh, at the bottom <laughs> there, uh, which I love. I don't know if it's something you teach, but I'm starting to teach it more and more where it's like just duck in and seal the guy, make it look like you're trying to get a layup, but actually hold him off so that you're ball handler can go and get that that layup at the last second talk to me about uh you know what you're telling these guys like we've sort of touched on it obviously but when they're rolling out uh you know do you like what are you telling them keep driving all the way down where are you comfortable with them going to and then the duck in at the end uh is that a good player making a good play or is that something you're teaching there 
So this player, uh, we're actually trying to convert him into a wing. So at his high school, he was just a big. So he's about 6'3". Okay. Uh, so again, he's a big for Japanese basketball. Um, but we're, he's going to the States next year um, to prep school. And so we're like, you need to be a wing. So for the most part, he'd been playing the wing for us. But our other big kid got hurt. So he had to start playing kind of the four. Um, and you can see he has some experience doing it because you can see he's sealing his guy there, like you said. And then you know, kind of creating some space for our guy to get in. Well, just keep, um, keep moving the whole way, right? Like, I can't tell you how much this annoys me when guys stop at, like, the free throw line. I'm like, what are you doing? Do you even want the ball? Like, <laughs> So right there, right? And our point guard didn't see him. Like, he, he has him there. Um, but he makes a good play here, you know, just to kind of be able to score this. Um, and, the, and this is late in the game, and we're searching for buckets here. Um May have gotten away with an extra step in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure, it's not that FIBA zero step. It's a zero kids... one two for sure. That's what I yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> like our kids are so confused by it. I'm confused by it. What is a zero step? What's not a zero step? Um, no, uh, I actually think that uh, that zero step has always existed. I'll tell you after the call why I think that. But if you think about the way that people always taught layups where it's like dribble right, right, right. one to like outside inside that first dribble technically if both of your feet are on the floor when you gather technically one of your feet is becoming a pivot foot already yeah, so the yeah. only way that you could ever get to those two steps would be as if that step counted as zero and then that first yeah. outside was one and then that second one was a pivot off of one but it's just really a matter of the way that you understand it, I think. So the interesting thing in Japan is that um, they're really starting to try to crack down on traveling. So we're getting a lot of these calls. I'm like, I'm, these aren't travels, um, but it's something that they're trying to, there were a lot of like, it was a Japanese thing to do. I don't, I, I, it's hard to describe it. They would, they would catch it and then one, two. Okay. And it wasn't a travel. Right before they, they would catch the ball and then they put go one, two with their feet. And, you know, every time like that's travel, that's travel. Right. Uh, because then they would do something else with the ball after that, after the catch. And so they started to crack down on it um, just recently. Now that they've, they're calling some kind of some unsure calls as far as what they're calling travels. Um, so I think the referees are also trying to learn um, how they, how they want to call it. So I, you and I spoke briefly when I was at an AAU tournament last weekend. I'm, I'm coaching some U17 right now. And on the bus ride home, like we were in Virginia Beach, which is a 14-hour bus ride from where I live in Toronto. And some of the coaches uh, that were at the front of the bus were like really complaining about traveling. And I, I know that one of them is a ref. And I'm like, the problem with traveling is that it's 100% an arbitrary call at this point because, and, and just like, this is 100% the truth. Most referees have not read a rule book. <laughs> and the ref that was with me was like, well, I'll be honest with you, I haven't. And I'm like, so then how can you as a coach expect the refs to get it right yeah. when you haven't read it yourself? And I mean, like I have, I'm, I'm that kind of guy that like sits around and reads that and like reads the case book every year when they re <laughs> reintroduce interpretations and all that. And like, you get into arguments sometimes and within like one or two sentences, it's like, look, I can tell you never have. So there's just no point in arguing this. It's, it's just basically a subjective call. A lot of the time now, if it looks funny, they're going to call it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I would agree on that part. If it looks funny to them. They're going to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that sir is the end of all of the video that I had. And, uh, if anyone has some questions, please feel free to jump in. If not, I'm going to wind down the show right here. Uh, but Chris, I want to take a few seconds just to uh, give you a very heartfelt thank you. I know I said something before, but I definitely want to say it on air and let you know, uh, you know, we're halfway around the world from each other in totally different time zones. Uh, and just like for you to jump on, Basically, at a moment's notice, uh, you know, short term notice, less than a week to, to really plan. I have nothing but admiration, respect, uh, et cetera, for I actually uh, I extend the warm welcome all the time. I actually have a former guest who just showed up at my place while we're recording. Oh, yeah. uh, so we're going to go out tonight and <laughs> spend some time on the town and see what uh, the ladies of Toronto are saying. But, uh, 
you know, anytime you're in the neighborhood, please reach out. Uh, like I said, I have nothing but respect for what you do and any way uh, that I can be involved. Uh, you know, really just giant thank you. And I'd love to help out. And to all the coaches who jump on, I know there's quite a few of you who are, uh, you know, familiar faces. Uh, once in a while, there's some new faces that come on. I got nothing but respect for you guys as well. Thank you. I hope this continues to be useful for you. And uh, I just really love doing it. So thank you, Chris. And uh, uh, good luck. Go Samurai, man. I <laughs> uh, appreciate you having me on. Thank you for, uh, for asking me. This has been fun. Good. Uh, yeah. Love it. Love it. Uh, I will be back next week on Run It Back. Chris, hang out for a minute or two. I'll stop the recording here. We can shoot the breeze a bit and see what you think. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody.